Don't just look at what's being done and think, how can I incrementally improve that? Instead, think of something totally fresh and something new that hasn't been done before. The world needs more of that, thinking you know, outside the box, thinking in new ways, rather than just incrementally repeating what's already been done. And ultimately, I think for most people, that's more fun. I think we're very fortunate that in a way that machines are really good at rote repetition and memorizing facts and, and doing the same thing 10, 100, 1,000 times. And for most people, that's not very fun. What people like to do, most people, is think creatively, do new things that haven't been done before, and interact with other humans. So those happen to be exactly the things where people have an advantage. So let, let's, let's go with that. That's Eric Brynjolfsson, an economist and a mindful optimist who believes instead of racing against the machine, we should race with the machine, side by side, reinventing the ways in which we live, learn, and work. Eric recently moved from MIT to join Stanford University in California. He's the Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki professor and senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. He's also the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. He's also the Ralph Landau Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, professor by courtesy at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Stanford Department of Economics, and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic research. To say that we have an expert with us on the show today would be an understatement. How do you navigate change? It's a question we think about often and one that today's world expects us to be comfortable with. The challenge, however, is where do you begin and how do you develop the mindset and skill set to be successful? Welcome everyone to the Sprint to Success with Design Thinking podcast. I'm your host, Saba Kidwai. Join me each week as I share the stories and strategies from the world's leading researchers and practitioners about why they believe the answer lies in practicing design thinking. I'm here at Stanford. My house is on Stanford campus, and I'm the director of the new Stanford Digital Economy Lab. I came over from MIT over the summer, although to be frank, I haven't had a chance to get into the office much because of covid But the people here have been just delightful. I knew most of them previously. There's so many interesting people in Silicon Valley and Stanford and just California. And uh, I've been learning a lot about AI and about technology. And and we've been having conversations about how the economy is changing. We've got an amazing team here. Some of the postdocs and grad students came over from MIT. Christy Koh, our executive director. So we've gotten up and going pretty rapidly. This past year, we all experienced the rapid acceleration of change in just about every area of our lives. From remote work to the news, our intimate relationship with technology has raised more questions than answers. Eric's research focuses on effects of digital technologies on the economy. To understand and solve today's complex challenges, collaboration across industries is essential. I first came across Eric's work when I read The Second Machine Age, a New York Times bestseller that he co-authored with Andrew McAfee, a research scientist at MIT. At a time when many fear change and worry that AI will take away our jobs, the book closes with a powerful reminder and call to action. Technology is not destiny, we shape our destiny. As an educator, my work with leaders and my research over the past few years has been a response to that call to action. If indeed we have the power to shape our destiny, what are the knowledge, skills, and mindset that we need to thrive, not only in workplaces, but as global citizens living through the second machine age? Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Eric as he helps us contextualize the changes we're experiencing and to explore in depth How might we shape our destiny, reinventing industries and creating new opportunities that bring everyone shared prosperity? Well, delighted to talk to you, Sab. I'm a big fan of what you've been doing, and it's always fun to to chat about these issues. I think we're in a time of tremendous change, and we call it the second machine age in kind of a parallel to what happened with the first industrial revolution or the era when we first started using machines to replace our muscles. Now machines are augmenting our brains and uh, artificial intelligence is a big piece of that, but really just computerization more broadly. 
It used to be affecting just a few narrow slices of the of society and the economy. Now it's affecting just about everything. I mean, every industry is being affected. And as you mentioned, you know, our politics are being affected, in, in not always in, in good ways. Um, AI really is controlling uh, what kinds of things are in our social media feeds, what kinds of ads we see, um, what news gets curated. And the intent from the people who use these two tools is to increase engagement, you know, find things that we find more interesting, which can be good. It can be make it more interesting for us um, by definition and more engaging. But often the things that are more engaging aren't necessarily the things that are true. Um, my colleague Sinan Errol did some amazing research with, uh, with Deb Roy and others at, at MIT showing that false news spreads three times faster than truth. And it's not because these algorithms specifically try to push falsehoods. It's because the false news is just tends to be more engaging. I mean, what's more unbelievable than something that's not true? <laughs> As Eric highlights in the study he shared, false news spread three times faster than truth. This isn't just a challenge facing adults. Many people assume that because young people are fluent in the use of social media, they can assess the validity of what they see as they scroll. A study released by the Stanford History Education Group in 2019 showed that quite the opposite is true. From assessing the trustworthiness of sources to differentiating between news and sponsored content, to evaluating sources during a search, the authors described the results as dismal, bleak, and a threat to democracy. This is also a challenge that education sociologist Paul Atwell highlighted in 2001, when he said that our challenge lies in addressing the digital use divide. It's not enough to give students computers. We must also change the tasks they do to enhance their problem solving, their creativity, and communication skills. This presents a fundamental challenge to societies as what we consume influences our beliefs, our decisions, and what we create. Given this scenario, I ask Eric to reflect on the quote, technology doesn't shape destiny, we shape our destiny. Is it too late for us to be able to do this? Well, I think that quote, which is the last line of the second machine age, um, sums up very well my philosophy. I, I like to call myself a mindful optimist. Uh, I think that we have the potential to have the next 10 years be the best 10 years in human history, but it, it's not at all automatic. We have tools that are more powerful than any tools we've ever had before. And by definition, a tool allows you to change things. It's, it, you can use it to amplify your skills and to do new things but they aren't automatically used to make things better. It depends on what our choices are. So a really important message is not to look at AI as necessarily bad, that it's gonna do terrible things, or AI necessarily good, that's equally mistaken. We have to look at AI as something that amplifies our values. And that puts a lot more weight on us thinking carefully about what we want these tools to do. We can, if we want to, use these tools to create more broadly shared prosperity, and education, something you've been working on, is a big part of that. Um, but I don't want people to get complacent and uh, and think that you know we're doomed or that everything's going to work out okay. Um, I'm happy that we have such powerful tools because mostly I think that if we really put our minds to, it, we will use these tools to make the world a better place. But it requires you know constant attention and vigilance. <laughs> Mindful optimist, Eric says AI is a tool, and like any other, it allows us to do things, both good and bad. However, he brings up an essential area for us to consider. What values do we hold dear that will inform our decisions as individuals and as societies? Eric says what we value will determine the types of environments we create. In the second machine age, he shares that during the first industrial revolution, it wasn't until 30 to 40 years later when work was reinvented that we started to see the productivity gains that allowed for an increasing number of society to benefit from the technological advances. I asked him to share more about this transition and to take us a little bit back into history about what we need to consider as we examine how to take advantage of the tools that we have today. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's a really important lesson. It's really a, a focus of a lot of my research, this idea that technology by itself is not enough. You need to make a lot of complementary innovations. And electricity is a, is a great example because we can look back you know, with the benefit of 100 years of history to see how it turned out. When American factories first electrified, surprisingly, there was almost zero productivity effect. Researchers like Paul David, David showed that. Um, but then they went and gradually started changing the way things were organized. They moved from having the steam engine, which had a central power source and pulleys and levers driving all the machinery, to having separate electric motors in each location. And once they did that, once they moved from that centralized structure to a new format where often the equipment was laid out over several acres, a single story factory, a very different layout than it was during the steam engine era, that's when you started getting huge productivity improvements, doubling and tripling of productivity. But strikingly, that took about 30 years or so, 30 to 40 years. And the real transition was the reinvention of work, not simply unplugging the steam engine, plugging in an electric motor. I think that's a very good analogy for what's going on today. I've seen it in many, many ways with, with, with actually the original steam engines in the 1820s, um, with uh, internal combustion engines, with computerization, with AI, with internet, with each wave, um, people like you and me and managers have to rethink how we organize work um, and even how we organize our society and democracy to take advantage of these tools and not end up making things worse by misusing them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think COVID almost like forced us all into that scenario. What role do you think COVID has played sort of in helping people think about exactly what you just shared? Well, you're, you know, we're doing it right now. We're, we're talking, uh, I guess uh, you're in Southern California, I'm in Northern California, but I, I'm doing, uh, we're all doing these, uh, these Zoom discussions and it's really accelerated a lot, the use of some of these technologies, remote work. I, I recently wrote a paper with some colleagues showing that about 15% of Americans work remotely in January of 2020, and that got up to 50%, more than a tripling by the middle of the year because of COVID, obviously. Uh, people couldn't go into work and they had to ro work remotely. Not everybody could do it, so it had very disparate effects, but it dramatically accelerated the adoption of some technologies. Technologies, by the way, that were already in place. I mean, Zoom, Slack, email, all these tools were sitting there, but it was a force that um, drove us to use them more uh, extensively. And I think that, that that's a, a good example of what's happening more broadly, that there are a whole bunch of very powerful tools out there. And when push comes to shove, we can learn to use them. Now, some of them are gonna turn out much better than we expected. Some of them will turn out worse than we expected, but that's the learning experience. Um, in, in other research, we showed that there's that what, what we call a productivity J curve with most of these technologies. It looks like a J because at first, oftentimes, there's a negative effect. Productivity goes down, but then later, the upside of the J curve, productivity really starts taking off. And um, but that, that period of slowing down can take uh, months or even years. It's why we're trying to sort through and figure out how to take advantage of these technologies. We saw it with electricity, we saw it with the steam engine, we saw it with a lot of different technologies. And uh, part of my research agenda is to kind of compress that downward part of the J curve and get us to have more time where we're harvesting the benefits. As Eric highlights, COVID forced us into an experiment we otherwise were not ready to take. Yet doing so has allowed us to explore new possibilities. I'm reminded here of a quote from the Second Machine Age, where the authors say, there's never been a better time to be a worker with special skills or the right education, because these people can use technology to create and capture value. However, there's never been a worse time to be a worker with only ordinary skills and abilities to offer, because computers, robots, and other digital technologies are acquiring these skills at an extraordinary rate. I ask Eric, is it possible for us to create a world where everyone can learn these skills and share in the prosperity? It's possible, but it's not inevitable. And this is an important lesson, you know, that we came through in the, in the second machine age. These are super powerful technologies that can make the pie a lot bigger, create 
you know, better health and wealth and, and solve all sorts of societal problems. But as you said, there's nothing in any textbook or economic theory that says everyone's going to be- benefit evenly. In fact, there's nothing that even says that uh, a majority of people are going to benefit. The good news is that for most of the past couple hundred years, technology was a rising tide that lifted most boats and most people were are dramatically better off than they were, say, in the 1800s or the 1700s. But unfortunately, the past you know, 20, 30, 40 years, we've seen a divergence. Andrew McAfee and I call it the great decoupling, where productivity has continued to grow. I'd love it to grow even faster, but it has been growing. But median wages have stagnated. And uh, that reflects the fact that this benefits of these technologies have disproportionately gone to a relatively small set of people, particularly people in the top 1%. And so the median income, the person at the 50th percentile and below, hasn't really shared in that benefit. I really want to underscore that there's nothing inevitable about that particular pattern. That was a set of choices we made consciously or unconsciously as a society in tax policy and the structure of uh, industries, and most importantly, in, in education. America used to lead the world in education. One of the reasons that America became so rich in the 1800s and 1900s, but also more equal than countries around the world, was because we were much more aggressive investing in K-12 through education, investing in, in colleges. And so America had the most educated workforce that took advantage of these leading technologies. Um, America's been falling behind on those dimensions by just about every metric. And... Um, We need to not simply invest more in education, we also need to reinvent education if we want to close that kind of gap and close the great decoupling so that not only is productivity growing, but we also have broadly shared prosperity. As we wonder how the United States went from leading education to falling so far behind, Eric highlights many lessons we can learn from the past to regain our status. He also shares why it's not enough to simply invest more in education, but why we must reinvent education to prepare the generation to come with the skills that complement machines. By now, I imagine you are wondering what skills do I need to thrive in today's second machine age? In 2019, Eric, along with Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon University, created a rubric that differentiated what tasks were good for machines and which were better suited for humans. To do this, they looked at a database called ONET, the online network data set that covers 964 occupations. I asked Eric to tell us more about the study and how we can utilize these findings for our own professional development. Absolutely. That's a really important point. You know, I'm a big fan of what AI can do, but there's too much hype at times. And some people pitch AI as if it's going to like replace all work. We're all going to have mass unemployment. And the reality is that AI, machine learning in particular, has had some amazing breakthroughs in certain specific areas in in vision systems, in voice recognition and language, in uh, lots of different categories of problem solving, basically anything that maps a set of inputs into a set of outputs. Those are very important problems, but they're far from the broad spectrum of what humans can do. Humans still have big advantages in many other areas. So what we set out to do in that study, we looked at what we call the tasks that are suitable for machine learning. And one of the first papers that Tom Mitchell from Carnegie Mellon and I wrote was in the journal Science about that. And since then, I've been working with Daniel Rock and Sarah Bana, uh, Sebastian Steffen and others to understand more broadly, what are those tasks? And what we did, you mentioned ONET, is we looked at a data set of, believe it or not, there's a data set of all the occupations in the U.S. economy. And for each occupation, it describes which tasks you need to do to be successful in that occupation. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, Radiology, you know, looking at medical images. Uh, Many people talk about how machines are going to replace that. Well, according to ONET, there are 27 specific tasks that a radiologist is supposed to be able to do. One of them, of course, is reading medical images, but they also sometimes conduct physical exams. They consult with other radiologists. They they give advice to patients. Many of these other tasks are not at all suitable for machine learning. That's a very typical example of what we found when we looked through all of the tasks that were in the economy and all of the occupations, that machine learning was good at some and not good at others. Now, this is a broad body of research, but let me sort of distill down some of the key takeaways. 
Um, machines are very good at routine information processing, doing repetitive work, and uh, using technology to solve those particular well-structured tasks. But machines are not good at several other categories. First off, broad-scale creative problem solving, you know, even just asking the right questions. That's something that scientists, entrepreneurs, managers, artists are all much better at. And so there's a lot of work to be done in those areas. There's another giant category that often isn't paid as much attention to, and that is emotional intelligence. So interpersonal skills, whether it's coaching, um, negotiating, selling, persuading people, getting people to care about things. These are areas where humans also have a huge advantage. Most of us would not want to be like a uh, have a pep talk from a robot coach at halftime um, or want a robot to be, you know, taking care of our, our three-year-old or four-year-old and, or for that matter, you know, managing a team of people um, and, and, and persuading them to, to do a better job. So those human areas are also ones that humans have relative strength in. And so what I like to see is a reinvention of education that focus less on rote memorization, following procedures, doing the kinds of things that machines could do well, and more on these other categories of creativity, of emotional intelligence, working in teams. If education were invented in that way, then we'd see humans being a complement to machines instead of humans racing against the machines and being replaced by them. And ultimately, that would lead to A, more productivity, but B, equally importantly, broadly shared prosperity. So one of the things we've done is uh, for each occupation, we identify the task and then using a related data set uh, from Burning Glass Technologies. This is a, a data set of over 200 million job postings. And we can just we can see where the demand is for new kinds of jobs. But also, if you have one particular set of skills, what are sort of the adjacent skills? And maybe your current job, if you're a, a bank teller or, or you know, customer service rep, Parts of that job are being replaced by machines, but there are other similar jobs that involve interacting with, with people and, and maybe having some problem solving skills that um, aren't so different from what you're currently doing. And you could, if you could learn those new skills, then you'd be in a position to, to have a lot more demand for what you're doing. I mean, a, a simple one that I think everyone can relate to, if you've got some statistical skills, you know, if you learn a little bit of Python, suddenly you're in huge, huge demand. And uh, many people already have a lot of the precursors, but they don't have that last bit. So our, uh, our roadmap helps individuals do that. We also have a version that's for companies so that HR managers or CTOs or even CEOs can look at their company and get a bit of a roadmap of where do they need more skills? What are the skills they already have? And how can they make that transition? fascinated by the comparative skills analysis Eric and Tom had curated. The ability to go in and see within a specific occupation where machines excel and where humans excel is a resource that can allow not just individuals, but companies to be proactive in reskilling the workforce. I asked Eric to share more and how countries around the world might be able to leverage this resource. We have some amazing data in the United States, like ONET. And so we did the first analysis using the ONET data and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and Bureau of Economic Analysis. And also a lot of the burning glass data is from the US. But in principle, this applies to any country. In fact, in a little while, I'm gonna give a talk to the G20 in Italy, and I'll be followed with some folks from the OECD and, and other countries and uh, describe exactly what we're doing. We've created a mapping from the U.S. categories to similar categories in other countries. Sadly, every country has a slightly different statistical system, but we can map over. And to the extent that, say, a customer service rep is doing similar work in Germany as they're doing in the United States, then our conclusions will apply over to them. So we do have a tool right now called World SML. SML means a suitability for machine learning that we have for, I think it's close to 100 countries now mapping it over. I mean, to be fair, I don't think that the coverage is always as good in some of the other countries as is in the United States, but it, it does, you know, one thing that I can imagine doing is at the national level, you know, the, the Ministry of Labor or the Prime Minister may want to do it in the kind of analysis that I just described for companies, but do it at the level of an entire country. As 
someone who's a world-renowned speaker and researcher, I was curious and asked Eric to share what examples he had seen in other countries that we could lean into. Who was adapting to the second machine age well, and who could we learn from? I don't think anyone's doing the whole thing from soup to nuts great, but there are bits and pieces we can learn from different countries. I'm really impressed by what Denmark has done with something they call flex security. It's this idea that we want to have flexible labor markets. And that's very important because the kinds of jobs that were important 10 or 20 years ago are not the same jobs that are going to be important 10 or 20 years in the future. And one of the biggest mistakes politicians make, I think, especially in the United States lately, is trying to freeze in and hold on to all the old jobs when what you really want to do is have a mobile, flexible workforce. But the other side of it is the security side. Um, Denmark is, is a pretty generous welfare state. And what they'll do is they'll make it easy for entrepreneurs to hire and fire people. They don't lock people in. But if somebody does lose their job, the safety net steps in and says, hey, of course, you're still going to have health insurance. Of course, your kids are still going to go you know, get school and, and all the other health and security uh, benefits of a, of a fairly generous welfare state. And actually, that makes people more willing to take risks, more willing to try new things. There's a lot of entrepreneurship. There's a lot of innovation. Um, so that's a model that I think the United States and other countries can learn from. You know, Denmark doesn't do everything right. That, by the way, that's where I was born. So I have a little bit of a, a, a soft spot, but also a extra insight in, in hanging out with them. You know, the United States has done some really amazing things. Um, and I'm very proud of, of what the U.S. has done, especially in basic R&D. Uh, it still has, I think, the best researchers in these areas, although there's good ones around the world. And that's very important to push that frontier. It has an entrepreneurial ecosystem that makes it easy for people to start new companies. It'd be great if even more people had access to that, because right now, uh, I don't think it's as widely distributed as it could be. Um, so those are a couple of examples of, of countries that are doing some things well. And the United States used to do even better you know, 50 years ago on things like education. And, and hopefully we'll get our mojo back in those areas. I'm very proud of what the, of Brit, what Britain did and the United States did in, in developing some of the vaccines using these tools. They have a not just entrepreneurial culture, but a scientific entrepreneurial partnership that brings these amazing research breakthroughs to market really, really quickly. And I'm actually very optimistic about the next 10 years in terms of progress on lots of dimensions of taking basic R&D and bringing it to the marketplace. But the short answer to your question is there's bits and pieces around the world that we can learn from. Mostly, I think we could do a lot, lot better. And uh, as an optimist, I see that as a good thing. It means that however we're doing now, there's room to do that much better. So, so the next five or 10 years, I expect an uptick in that J-curve and increased productivity growth. What I appreciate most about Eric's work is that he provides an evidence-based foundation for every industry as they reinvent their systems. However, we often hold many assumptions about different economic systems around the world. And so I asked Eric how he would respond to individuals who are fearful of a welfare state and the role this plays in relationship to innovation and entrepreneurship so that we may have, as Eric says, shared prosperity. Well, first off, I'm a huge fan of free markets and I love the markets. They, they do so much. It's, it's a huge wealth generation engine. But one of the reasons markets can be successful is if they have the complementary government support. You know, like I mentioned, education, infrastructure, the rules of the game. You go back to Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations. He was very clear you have to have government step in and maintain competition. He said that when businessmen get together, business people get together, they will often end up colluding to restrain trade and hold up prices. And he said that was really bad. And government needs to make sure that there's free and fair competition it doesn't happen automatically. And then, you know, there's some things that are really just just value judgments. You know, I mean, it's great that the world has created more wealth than ever before. There's more billionaires and millionaires, maybe soon trillionaires than ever before. But we have to decide how we want to allocate the wealth of society. And if we have more people have opportunities, I suspect we'll create even more wealth. But, um, you know, there's a value judgment about how we divide that up and, and different people are going to come down in, in different ways. Countries like, uh, you know, Germany and Denmark have 
been able to maintain a market system while also being fairly generous. The United States used to be more like that. Um, we were just talking about that, the conversation with, with Michael Dell, and, and I guess a lot of people don't know that when the United States was growing its fastest in the middle of the 20th century, uh, top income tax rates were about 70%. So, that, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that that's the right level, but certainly it's possible to have very progressive income taxes and a lot of growth at the same time. These are discussions that I think uh, our politicians have to have about how we can have not just prosperity, but shared prosperity. In his insightful talks and in his books, Eric stresses the importance of reinventing education and shifting the skills we place emphasis on. Reform in education is not entirely new. So why then have we not been able to scale the pockets of innovation that we do see? Three researchers decided to explore this very question further. After examining education reform over the past century, professors Larry Cuban and David Tyak at Stanford, along with William Tobin from St. Patrick's College, say our lack of success in scaling is largely due to what they call the grammar of school. Like languages, they say, schools also have a grammar, age-old practices that are rarely questioned, such as the grading system, age-level groupings, compartmentalized subjects, and so on. When we layer innovations on top of these age-old practices, we often evoke an atmosphere that constantly feels like one more thing. Moreover, in these cases, by failing to redesign the environments, we often substitute age-old practices using the tools we have, creating an illusion of transformation. As a professor himself, Eric shares his own experience, along with advice for education leaders today, about the most important skills and practices we should lean into. My own industry is education, and I have to say, it's one of the ones that's often on the lagging edge of things rather than the leading edge. And too often, I think people slip into this old fashioned, you know, have students sit in rows of chairs, listening to lectures, memorize facts, regurgitate different methods of solving things. And all those methods may have once been useful if you wanted to build a, you know, a, a mass production economy and, and, and workers who could uh, work for Henry Ford and on an assembly line. But it's not at all what we need today. Today, obviously, machines are very good at following road instructions and memorizing facts. So let's not have humans do those things any more than we'd have humans like learn how to multiply nine digit numbers together. I mean, let's, let's let machines do that. What humans have a real aptitude for is creativity and interpersonal skills and empathy. So in my courses, I try to have people spend a lot of time figuring out how to ask the right questions, how to solve problems how to define problems and work in teams. Everything tends to be project-based and team-oriented. Those are the kinds of skills and practice that people need going forward. And I'm hopeful that more and more educators will experiment with those things. Um, and I think, I mean, on that last point about experimenting, I think that's another important thing. I want to be a little bit humble that I don't think I know all the answers about how education should be done, but I do know a method that works. And what I've seen, especially in Silicon Valley, but around the world, is this concept of experimentation or A-B testing, where you try two alternative ways of solving a problem and you see which one works better. That's how science and why science advanced so much over the past three or 400 years. It's beginning to come into business. I hope it's beginning to come into education. And one of the reasons I'm excited about digital education is not just that it's a way of getting knowledge to, to millions or even billions of people, but it's also a platform that makes it much easier to do this learning and experimentation about how to learn. So what I see at Udacity and Coursera and MITx and Stanford is people trying different ways of structuring a course, different hints or not hints, different formats. And then they see how well people are learning, how engaged they are. And you have a much more rapid feedback loop. And if you're humble and say, hey, we're gonna let the data speak. We're gonna let the data tell us what works for students and what doesn't work you're much more likely to make progress and come up with better and better education. I'm actually a little disappointed it hasn't happened faster, but again, being a hopeless optimist, maybe a mindful optimist, um, I think that over the next 10 years, education is going to get dramatically better. We will see more personalized education, customized to different uh, learning styles. 
faster learning, and people are going to pick up information and knowledge and skills so much more rapidly in the next 10 years than they did when I was in school. It needs the kind of revolution that we described with electricity in the factories. We had these amazing tools, but people keep doing things the same old way. And uh, they need people like you to kind of break the mold and say, hey, there's some very different ways we could be doing things. And not that we've got an exact roadmap of how to do it, but we have to be willing to experiment because it's impossible that taking a piece of, of chalk, a piece of stone and scraping it across a slate piece of rock is still the best way to do things when we have all these new tools available and all this data that's available. So, so let's, uh, let's uh, think outside the box a little bit about how we can do education better. Inspired by Eric's work and the idea of experimentation, I became increasingly curious and began learning more about how design thinking and the design sprint frameworks could help facilitate the conversations as we reinvent our systems. In addition to the skills, design thinking also helps us develop the mindset shift we need to be more empathetic, to embrace ambiguity, to make and iterate, and to build our creative confidence. It also provides us with a structure to have often uncomfortable and overwhelming conversations as we engage in this work, because for so many of us, it can be so challenging to know where do we even begin. To examine what this looks like in practice, I spent the past three years researching the systems at Design 39 Campus, a K-8 public school in San Diego, California, that utilizes design thinking in everything they do. I examined the knowledge, the motivation, and the organizational influences that allowed the educators, or as they call themselves, learning experience designers, to be successful at challenging the traditional practices as they design a new grammar of school where their mission is to create life-ready thought leaders who elevate humanity. Let's listen in to a learning experience designer as she shares the impact design thinking has had on her practice. The mindset of a design thinker is, I've got to solve this right away. And that's where we want our kids to go. And so through lots and lots of practice and steps and teaching, we hope that they embrace it as part of their mindset too. I see how we implement it, not just through curriculum, but I think when socially kids are having problems, instead of just focusing on what's your problem, what are you going to do about it? Like, let's design a solution and let's see that if that solution works. And if not, okay, let's go back to the root of the issue. Let's think of that empathy piece. So we've incorporated it, not just in, okay, let's do design thinking projects. It's now just become a way of thinking. It's how we plan as well. We are living the design thinking process and then we're incorporating it into our classrooms. So it is now after practice, it's now naturally where I think year one and two, we did a lot more like, we're doing a design thinking project because that's, we were still very new at it. And now it's just, I think, embedded in how we are teaching, how we are planning, where it's not everything is a design thinking now. And then it's not just one project is going to be design thinking. We are living the design thinking process every day. If you're interested in learning more about the study, you can visit www.askmissq.com, A-S-K-M-S-Q.com, or follow me across any of my social media channels where I share a lot of the research and little sound bites from the different interviews that we did with the learning experience designers at Design 39. We know that this work will take time. However, students' lives are not at a standstill. I asked Eric what advice he would give to students so that they could begin to take action immediately on developing the knowledge, the skills, and the mindset to be successful in the second machine age. You know, one thing, and maybe it sounds a little trite, is you really got to find the things that excite you, that you're passionate about, you know, especially for PhD students. Sometimes they're like, okay, I should study this because that's the hot topic. And, and I, I try to sense from, is that something you're really personally excited about? To do a great dissertation, I know from experience, you have to like, you know, be willing to work all night at times and, and focus on something that just day after day, month after month, even year after year. And as far as I can tell, nobody is able to do that just based on external incentives, you know, because someone else tells them or because they have to do it to, to, you know, meet a deadline or something. You have to do it because you personally are excited about it and, and self-motivated. And when you wake up in the morning, you're interested. 
in doing that. It doesn't mean you're always going to be excited. I mean, there's going to be times you just have to slog through, but there's got to be this core element that, hey, we're doing something important. And for most people, that means that something that you can convince yourself is important to the world, is going to change the world. So I, I, I encourage them to look for those kinds of things that they're excited about. I think it applies more broadly, you know, um, and that is that, you know, don't just look at what's being done and think, how can I incrementally improve that? Instead, think of something totally fresh and something new that hasn't been done before. The world needs more of that, um, thinking, you know, outside the box, thinking in new ways, rather than just incrementally repeating what's already been done. And ultimately, I think for most people, that's more fun. Uh, I think we're very fortunate that in a way that machines are really good at rote repetition and memorizing facts and, and doing the same thing 10, 100, 1,000 times. And for most people, that's not very fun. What people like to do, most people, is think creatively, do new things that haven't been done before, um, and interact with other humans. So those happen to be exactly the things where people have an advantage. So let, let's, let's go with that. As Eric says, the world needs more people who are willing to take risks, try new things, and be creative. It's ultimately what brings us alive. On Inauguration Day, Vice President Kamala Harris also expressed a similar sentiment when she encouraged audiences to innovate, reminding us that great experiments, she said, take great determination. The will to do the work, and then the wisdom to keep refining, keep tinkering, and keep perfecting. She was essentially recommending that we all engage in design thinking. I asked Eric what policies he believes will be important for governments to consider moving forward. Well, it starts with exactly what you said, which is an attitude, which is a mindset of let's experiment, let's make progress, let's not try to ossify and freeze in all the things that we used to do. America has never been successful by just locking itself into the same old way of doing things. It's always been innovating and experimenting. But I think that the, the big opportunity that we haven't taken as much advantage of is there are so many brilliant people in the country that don't have the same kind of opportunity. And the more shots on goal we get, the more people from disadvantaged parts of the country, disadvantaged groups, people who haven't had access to the education or even basic health, the more of those people that we bring in as part of the innovation economy, the more it's going to benefit all of us. So I'm very happy that this is, this is a focus of the new administration, creating a, an infrastructure, uh, digital, creating investment in, in education and health, making sure everybody, I mean, it, it seems so basic to me that you want everyone to have health, especially kids. It can't be cost effective to, to not provide that for people. Um, there's also, you know, to get a little bit wonky about some of the economics, interest rates are incredibly low. Real interest rates are actually negative right now. Um, inflation is below target or has been for the past uh, 10 years or so. So we have an opportunity to spend money to make these kinds of investments just by borrowing it. We don't need to worry as much about the deficit right now. So there's an opportunity to make some really big infrastructure, research, education, other investments. And as long as interest rates are negative, that's an opportunity that we should take advantage of. I don't think it'll always be negative. And I think eventually those interest rates will come up. But it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't make those kinds of investments and, and go big right now. Um, I also think that, you know, I see very much almost all of my, uh, not all, but more than half of my, my postdocs and grad students are um, from overseas. They come from India, China, Germany, Pakistan, and um, they're doing amazing things. And the United States has been a magnet for talent for all of its history. And We've lost a little bit of that um, in the past few years, but if we can keep America as a magnet for talent, that's definitely good for America. And it's good for all Americans. I think it's also good for the world because you bring people together and they're allowed to cooperate on things. They can create more value. They can invent what we see around me here in Silicon Valley and, and in many other places. And uh, having people be able to freely cooperate like that is another big plus. So I'm hopeful we'll see more of that in, the, in this uh, new administration. But I, I, I've very much enjoyed my conversations with, with um, the, the leading folks in, in this administration. Actually, the last administration, we had an AI summit. It was great to, to be participating in that. And the one before that um, also had three AI summits, all of which 
we're efforts to uh, address these opportunities. Absolutely. And I feel like this conversation in and of itself is such a great example of that. Like, you know, I'm passionate about something. The idea that I can take an author that's sitting on my shelf and now be sitting here having a conversation with them, I think just speaks to so much of the possibility of what we can do today. So yeah, so I'm just very intrigued by just this like entire dynamic that's happening. Like all of your other outlets, I feel like this is such an optimistic conversation. It gives me so much optimism for what's possible. And I think a lot of people are going to be excited once this, you know, COVID wave kind of settles to kind of reimagine and redesign a lot of our things. Eric, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for what you're doing. And I, I think ultimately, the more people who are making the kinds of investments that you're doing in terms of getting people to think about these issues and invest in education, re-educating. I mean, when I make the list of things that we need to do in our society, that's absolutely at the top of the list, you know, from my book and from all my other speaking, that's always what I start with. So I'm very grateful that you're, you're doing this and uh, I wish you the best of luck. This conversation in and of itself is an example of just what's possible in today's world. Eric went from being an author on my bookshelf, whose work inspired me to being a mentor an advisor, and today a very generous and humble guest on the podcast. As Simon Sinek reminds us, alone is hard, together is better. And this conversation will forever serve as a reminder about the importance of cross-collaborating with people in different industries and the opportunities we have to talk with people and learn from them anytime and anywhere are truly remarkable. At this moment in time, we stand at a crossroads where moving forward is not just about solving an economic challenge or a technology challenge, it's about solving a human challenge where every individual has an opportunity to reach their potential and see themselves in a way that others may not, simply because they've never seen it before. That's ultimately what we believe is shared prosperity. You can learn more about Eric's work by visiting the links in the show notes or by visiting the blog post at askmissq.com. On the website, you'll also have an opportunity to learn more about my research and the role that design thinking can play in the work you do. Thank you so much for listening in today. And as the authors remind us in the second machine age, technology is not destiny, we shape our destiny. And I wish all of you the best as you embark upon that journey. It's your turn to join the conversation by sharing what you enjoyed or what questions you still have. In a world where time and attention are so valuable, thank you for choosing to listen and for being a part of our Sprint to Success with Design Thinking community. 